grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. What our gospel reading cuts off, of course, as it pointed out in the children's message, is the nunc diminis. Here is the salvation that was promised to the world, that Simeon was promised that he would see before he would die. And even though the angel had appeared to Mary and to Joseph and and they had been told to name their son Savior, it was still a marvelous sight to see this prophet of the Lord declare such things about their son. After all, yes, he's the Lord of the universe, but he can't even wipe his own bottom yet. Yes, he's the Lord of the universe, but he can't even crawl. Yes, he's the Lord of the universe, but he can't even speak. He lets Mary and Joseph know what he needs by crying, and then you play the guessing game with the baby. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Is your diaper dirty? Are you just grouchy today? And you try to figure it out. Maybe you got some gas. Yet here is the light of the whole world in the flesh. And Simeon blesses them, blesses the whole family, and then speaks a word of warning. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed. A sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And if you read the Gospel of Luke... You read the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, even John. You know that Jesus comes back to the temple many times. He's famously found there when he's 12 years old. We don't know if he was brought there or not. We just we just find him there. And then, of course, uh, John 10, the Feast of Dedication. He is at the temple. And then after the triumphal entry, he goes to the temple several times. But the two times he, are, he is brought to the temple is here where he's declared the blessing of all the nations Anna will celebrate later in the gospel passage and when he is arrested and brought and illegally tried and condemned to death when Simeon's prophecy will be brought about and the death of Christ will pierce Mary, for she is his mother, and the dividing line of history. Is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, or is he not? That's the only question in life that matters. It's the only question in life you get graded on at the end, and it's pass-fail. Is Jesus the Christ, or is he not? And it seems tempting to think that this little baby here is not God. It seems ludicrous that that the one who has the cherubim around him, that when they speak, the heavens shake, would come in the form of a baby who would endure nine months in the womb and then be born, have to learn how to speak, how to learn how to talk, how to feed himself and then be reviled, be scourged, be beat, and be killed. No other religion puts its God to the death. It seems so wrong, so backwards. No other religion puts God in the flesh. It's humans who suffer, not God. It's humans who experience pain, not the one who creates the universe. It's humans who die. God cannot die. That seems ludicrous. It seems crazy. Now, now maybe when Jesus was an adult, God would come upon him. But before Jesus died, God, God would leave, right? And in those two minutes, I just expressed three of the great heresies within history, by the way. We're not going to get into them all. 
But it, it is beyond belief that he who creates us, who feeds us, who sustains us, who makes the earth revolve around the sun and the sun to rise and set every day, the one who controls the vast expanse of the universe would come and experience everything that humans have to experience. This is the greatest mystery of the faith. This is the incarnation, even more than the Trinity. The Trinity, you can explain, well, God is far above us, so we can't understand. But the incarnation, that God would come into the flesh, does not make sense unless it is explained only by the fact that God loves you. That the perfect God would come into the imperfect creation. That the sinless God would take on sin. That the deathless God would die. Only makes sense if God loves you. And this is why we in the scripture say God is love. Because Christ came into the flesh and died upon the cross for us. Not because of this general vibe of positivity, but a specific action in history. God loves us so much that you could hold him as a baby. God loves us so much that he fell down and skinned his knees. That he had to say goodbye to friends and family as they died and he wept at their tombs. That there was crowds desperately hungry for the shepherd and he would have compassion on them. He would feed them. He would heal their diseases. He would cast out demons and he would know that he's going to wake up and do it again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that until he'd be put to death. Here is the one that the Old Testament points to. Here is the one that the New Testament points back to. Here is God. And why is he here? Because you and I messed up. Because our parents, back in the garden, screwed it all up. And the world went sideways, to put it not bluntly. Because you and I have a problem. We could get everything we want for Christmas and we'd still want more. We could be kings of the earth and it wouldn't be enough. You could have more money than there has ever been created and it still wouldn't be enough. We desire to be like God. And we choose our sin over that which is good. And yet, God still comes for us. God still comes to rescue us. Do you know what the number one rule of saving somebody who's drowning is? Do not have them drown you. When somebody's drowning, they panic. They grab onto whatever they can. They throw it under the water, trying to keep their head above water. This is why lifeguards grab people around the neck when they swim to shore. Because in that moment of drowning, people panic. They can't think straight. We're panicking and we're drowning and God comes and rescues us and he dies for us. He takes our death upon himself. He takes our sin upon himself. He takes our evil choices upon himself and gives us the good. He gives us life everlasting. The forgiveness of sins. 
He gives us a right relationship with God. And since we have been reconciled to God, we now get to take that good news, we now get to take that gospel out into a whole world that is drowning. And we get to preach the good news, the peace that surpasses all understanding, that even though you die yet, there is one who can make you alive. That even though this body might waste away in sickness and in death, there is one who will resurrect it on the last day. That even though that there is evil all over the world, there is still yet something that is good and transcends the evilness of the world. That there is hope and peace in love. And it comes to us with God taking on our flesh as we confessed the assumption of the humanity into the divinity. Christ is eternally, fully human and fully God. Never stop and think about that. The promise of the resurrection isn't just a spiritual one, but a physical one promise of Christmas, the promise of Easter, is that creation will be remade right, good, sinless, perfect, and that the light of the world will dwell with us. This is the hope we rejoice at this Christmas tide. This is the love that we get to proclaim to our neighbors and our friends. This is what sustains us. Not anything else, but the fact that our God chose the poopy diapers for us. In Christ's name, amen.